bring the purpose of this little entertainment into focus, I would like to quote Henry David Thoreau. In Walden, he says, As long as I can enjoy the friendship of the seasons, I trust that nothing can make life a burden to me. Where, I ask you, could one find a better chance to enjoy such a friendship than here in Montana? We sing praises of Montana as the treasure state, but those who truly love her look beyond material wealth to the glory of her out of doors, her mountains and lakes, her wildlife, trees and flowers, her vast prairies and the wonder of her skies. Katie Swan was one of the early environmentalists. He was in Missoula. He was working here and he was working as a photographer. You can tell from his photographs, you can tell from his life, and you can tell from his love of the land that he served that he had a deeply committed sense of landscape and a committed sense for why the landscapes must be preserved. My father, Katie Swan, was born September 16th in 1887 in Dorchester, Massachusetts. From the beginning of his life, he was an outdoor person and he got his interest in mountains by climbing around on the Blue Hills of Massachusetts, which to a Montanan did not look like mountains, but that was all he had to work with. He graduated from the forestry school at Harvard and came to Montana in 1911 to be a forestry assistant. It's hard to think in 1911 in Massachusetts, or even as he was growing up as a young man, that there was much uh, in, this, in the sense of a wilderness experience in Massachusetts at that time. I mean, it had been settled since the 1600s and very densely. I can't imagine how he must have seen the Montana landscape when he got off the train because it is so different. I mean, the forests are different, the scale is different. I think that's what Swan as a photographer had to struggle with. I think that's what photographers who come to the West have to struggle with is how do you capture the grandeur of the scale in an eight by 10 photograph or something smaller? Just imagine that, starting from back there. It's all settled up and, geez, a great new world out, uh, out here that we could have something to do with. Yeah, <laughs> so that's how I would have felt, I'm sure. KD, I think he was kind of made for that. He wanted to be in the brush, and it seemed like he was a natural. When KD comes west, in my mind, he's really in some respects, part of this generation on the East Coast that's going to be the first to actually see the West and feel it and touch it. He's not going to know it just through photographs and just through paintings. He's going to actually experience it firsthand. And he's going to be able to reinterpret it as a person who's actually living there. When these young idealists came from Boston and New York and Philadelphia and elsewhere, and they arrived in the West, they discovered a new land and they became new people. I think he was totally enchanted by being out west and doing something primary in the Forest Service. So when Swan comes out to Montana shortly after he graduates from Harvard in 1911, this is the peak of the American industrial empire. I mean, we are the country that's turning out fabulous amounts of 
steel, incredible architecture, all kinds of industrial products, and the West is basically the warehouse of them. Well, I think most of the people who went into the Forest Service, and Katie Swan is an example of this, really believed that the government had a role to play in the management of natural resources. That's idealistic because no one had ever thought of that before. In the past, the role had been for the government is to get rid of the land, sell it, trade it, let people steal it. It really didn't matter as long as it left the public domain. But in the late 19th century, as people we now call conservationists started to realize that these natural resources on public lands were being squandered, that the national economy, in fact, could only grow so far until it collapsed because we had destroyed those natural resources. They began to argue in the 1870s and 1880s that we really needed a federal governmental role on the landscape. Call it now the Forest Service. That's not what they had in mind. That wasn't the term they used. But they wanted some place in the federal government to control natural resources and, frankly, to control our own behavior, to slow down our consumptive desires. Forestry began before the turn of the century, but the, the act that created the National Forest was 1905. That's when Gifford Pinchot and uh, President Roosevelt got together and, and they worked out the National Forest System. So in about the time A.D. came there, of course the Forest Service was very young, I think five, six years or so, as we know now, that he was uh, in the beginning, really. And of course, the settlement of the country was pretty young also. Katie Swan is really key to the early years of the agency's life in many respects. But the fascinating thing is that he was coming from Harvard, hardly Montana stock in that respect. But that's the kind of person that went into the agency, often very well educated, often from the East, but who was swept up with the idea of the Forest Service, swept up with the idea of the West. And that's the kind of person that Gifford Pinchot was looking for. He and his peers in the agency in Washington would constantly go to every single college they could, talk about the mission of the agency. And because Pinchot himself was almost, well, he was charismatic, but he was almost a minister in a sense, he would sweep up these young men who would think nothing of dropping whatever it was they were studying, taking up science, going into biology labs, and then going to Harvard or Yale for graduate school, and then hopping a train and ending up in Missoula, which in 1911 was not Harvard. It wasn't New York, and it wasn't any place that Swan had ever seen before. So it's a fascinating way by which we look at how idealism really drove this agency early in its career. What Pinchot didn't know, and what Katie Swan didn't know, and what most of them didn't know was actually very much. They didn't know anything about the land that they had inherited. They didn't know its size. They didn't know its extent. And so the first job is really ride the land. Get on a horse and get out there to see what it is. Write reports. Do survey lines. Start to build the first fire lookouts. Start to rationalize the landscape. And when I first went in the Forest Service, I can't remember meeting KD exactly in a certain time in a certain place. I think he grew on me gradually because we had some of KD's photos before he was regional photographer. He was taking them just because he was a photographer, a heart at heart and alive, and he enjoyed it. So he did a lot of photography before he became the regional photographer. But as time went on, pretty soon you, we began to look and see it, hey, D take this, before we'd ever seen him even. So it sort of grew like that. And then later on, I think it was after he was a regional photographer, then I began to see him in, specifically in places. We'd be working along, somebody come through, usually somebody with him. It'd be somebody from the district trying to show him someplace he could get the picture he wanted. And then after he'd pull out and go by, they'd say, the guys would say, well, who the hell is that guy with all the cameras around his neck, you know? Well, we'd say, that's, uh, that's KD, you know? Well, KD Swan worked for the Forest Service from 1911 to 1947. He didn't begin as a photographer. There was a culture where the camera was just there, and anybody could have picked it up 
but KD was taking good pictures. So he was allowed to continue and encouraged and given more and more assignments. In Swan's photos, you can see his landscape photos are very carefully composed. He waited for the right light. He would frame a photograph with an interesting tree kind of coming up out of one edge of the photograph. Or he would use a mule or a human being to give some sense of scale to the peaks or the lake or the forests. In my father's book, Splendid Was the Trail, he wrote, taking pictures with a cumbersome view camera, such as was commonly used at the time I started my picture taking career in the Forest Service, was a much more laborious process than shooting scenes with the superb and easily handled equipment available today. But work with the old fashioned view box that had to be mounted on a stout tripod had its compensations. For me, there was immense satisfaction in pulling a black cloth over my head and seeing the image on the ground glass viewing screen. Of course, this image would be upside down, but with a little practice, the photographer learned to make allowances for this inversion and to judge the merits of the composition. I often moved the camera several times in composing a picture. Patience paid big dividends in final results, I soon learned. When he first was a regional photographer, he was known well enough in the fire game, so the regional office would direct him, now don't you let them put you on a fire. You get the pictures. In Swan's memoir, one of the things that was so striking to me was he was talking about being sent out to photograph a series of forest fires and a man was killed in the fire and the packer had to take the corpse down the trail at night and he didn't want to go by himself and Swan was leaving the next day anyway so he volunteered to accompany him and he was riding his horse behind the packer through the forest in you know moonlight or starlight and the corpse was wrapped in white canvas and Katie Swan said something like, one of the most vivid photographs I have is one I never took. And that's the picture of that man being taken down the trail in, in moonlight. And that tells us, I think, a lot about Katie Swan and the respect that he had for the people he worked with, you know, the conditions under which they worked, his own visual sense. But that's a story, it's not a photograph. But it helps us in looking at his photographs to understand the sentiment that he brought to his work. When Gifford Pinchot establishes the Forest Service and becomes the first forester, he makes photography very central to the agency from the start. He hires a man by the name of Sudworth, who was a botanist, to basically write the directive on photography. The Forest Service set the standard that imagery is important and you have to hire people to take pictures. There's a public beyond the image. That is, he's photographing for a larger audience, internal to the agency and in time for a broader American public. Gifford Pinchot thought that the camera was the most important instrument that the Forest Service had at its disposal. Not the Pulaski, the great instrument that he used to fight, fight fire, not the telephones and the telegraphs, not the budget, not even the people who worked for the agency. It was the camera. And why? Because he understood that the image was everything. You could write long reports, but no one would read them. If you could show them photographs of the Rockies that have been despoiled, you have your argument already made. People were not comfortable with a large federal bureaucracy. So when you have a new agency like the Forest Service coming into the West, which was basically seen as this great resource for the development of capitalism, right? Mining, lumber, uh, agriculture, seemingly endless resources that could be used to develop uh, homes, homesteads, factories, the great industrial uh, economy of the United States. They had to explain to an American populace what this new agency was doing, what it was in charge of. 
And because a lot of those areas were inaccessible to the vast majority of Americans, the work that Katie Swan did in you know, climbing these peaks, lugging his equipment on these very difficult hikes and treks and photographing in all kinds of circumstances, I think was really invaluable because it then created this body of photographs. What I think is also important about Katie Swan was Gifford Pinscher had a policy where photographers were not necessarily given credit for their images. It was just Forest Service photographer. But with KD, his images were so spectacular that he is the first one who gets this byline that says, photographed by Katie Swan. This was pretty revolutionary for the government to be so actively involved in what we today look at as art. I mean, they may not have looked at it as art at that point, but today we see Katie's images as pieces of art. My dad took thousands of photographs while he worked for the Forest Service, but he also made short movies. In 1929, he shot a film called Trail Riders of the North. A group of riders on horseback traveled from the South Fork of the Flathead River, past the Chinese Wall, and out the Sun River. This area of Montana is now called the Bob Marshall Wilderness, after my father's good friend, Bob Marshall. And I can remember him as a visitor in our home. And of course, uh, they were talking all the time about wilderness and they got together for hikes and for discussion. But Bob Marshall became an amazing hiker in that he would go maybe 30 miles a day, which is unheard of. and impossible for most hikers, but um, he just had to see it all. People like Swan and earlier explorers who had come out, part of their mission, I think, as conservationists, or if we want to say early environmentalists, was to let people in the East or the Midwest who didn't have a chance to come out here know that this was part of the American landscape part of um, America's legacy, so to speak, part of the whole tradition of American wilderness in the late 19th and early 20th century was the notion that in the West you had these natural landscapes that rivaled the great cultural landscapes of Europe. Right? This was what America could give to the world versus the, the cathedrals of Paris or, you know, the monuments of the old world, America had this fabulous natural landscape. And eventually I think that Swan wanted to convey that these were places worth preserving. His job was to get the pictures and, uh, and get them in there, and he knew that if he could do that right, he'd make a big difference. I do see my dad as one of the early conservationists, although uh, it was not probably a well-known thing at that time. But I think in his own mind and in his life, he was demonstrating his feelings toward conserving what was important to him and what was beautiful and what should be saved. Why I'm so enamored of people like Katie Swan is because the good that they did, the splendor that they saw, and the works that they produced are really a testimony to how we might better live on the land. I tell the children, it's time to hit the home trail. It's been a long day. We left long before sunup by the light of a candle lantern.
It will be long after dark when we reach our car at the foot of the mountain. The sun is gone now. The short winter twilight will fade quickly. And so we leave the pines on the ridge to keep watch during the long winter night. Sentinels to guard the fabulous world which we have just left. And here we leave you. Au revoir.